Hello, everybody. Thank you for being with us today. My name is Alex Novens. I am the safety director for Slurry Pavers. We are a road maintenance contractor uh, here in Virginia, but our blueprint kind of stretches from Delaware down to South Carolina. Um, we do various processes, but today we're going to focus on full depth reclamation. So today's agenda, why is safety important? We'll talk about some accident statistics, um, general work zone safety, backing safety, utility hazards. Why is safety important? A company's most valuable asset is its employees. If you don't have employees, you can't get the work done. Um, safe workers will equal, ha equal happy workers. If your workers aren't happy, they're not going to be excited to go to work. If they fear for their lives when they're at work, then it's not going to be a safe work environment. Workplace efficiency. If you have accidents, your company is not running smoothly. The claims and the costs of work. If you have accident claims, a uh, backing accident, that piece of equipment is down. It slows down your production. Um, the cost of an injury is far more expensive than the five minutes you saved not getting somebody to help you back up. But most importantly, families and friends. Everybody wants to go home to their families the same way they showed up to work in the morning. And I know for our company, many of your employees are also brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins of each other. Everybody wants to go home safely, and I know every parent wants to go home safely to their children. For the most part, you work with these people 10, 12 hours a day, five days a week. You're spending more time with them than you are with your families at home. Workplace fatalities. Uh, 29 Virginia workers have died in job-related injuries and illness through the end of July compared to the 31 deaths of all of 2015. More than half of those deaths occurred in the general industry with nine of the 29 in the construction industry. Uh, you have workers killed by motorists, workers killed by work zone equipment on the job site. We can do everything right in our work zones, but the X factor is that we are working around the public. Construction workers on sites and highways are at risk for serious injuries and fatalities. We work in congested areas, exposed to high traffic volume speeds, as well as under conditions of low lighting, low visibility, and inclement weather. You're on the highway. You can wear all your vests and reflective clothing possible. Some people aren't going to see you. And I know I've been on a job site with, on the highway with cars whipping by at 80 miles an hour, and you feel that gust of wind hit you, and it'll pull your, your hard hat right off you. The work is routinely near moving construction vehicles as well as the motor, motoring public. The primary cause of worker fatalities in 2005 to 2014, runovers or backovers, vehicle equipment collisions, and caught between as struck by hazards. These are all vehicle hazards. And in FDR, most people are in pieces of equipment, luckily. But as you see here, sometimes you have to go out and get close to the equipment. And everything's moving, a lot of moving parts. You have to be aware of your surroundings. And the operators have to be aware of employees that may be on the ground. As you can see on this graph, work zone crashes occur every 5.4 minutes. Every day, 70 work zone crashes occur that result in at least one injury. Every week, 12 work zone crashes occur that result in at least one fatality. Here, you see a down tick of accidents, and then you start seeing it go back up. 2011-2012 is the smartphone boom. You had iPhone 4 come out, and everybody became glued to their phones. You drive around. Up and down the road, eight out of 10 drivers are either talking on their phone, texting, doing something. They're distracted. That's what it is. And when you have a crew of 15 guys that are standing there on the side of the highway, they are very vulnerable to a car flying towards them. We also, not only do we need to protect our employees, we also need to protect the traveling public. Uh, road traffic control involves directing of vehicular and pedestrian traffic around a construction zone, accident, or other road disruption 
thus ensuring the safety of emergency response teams, construction workers, and the general public. We need to protect them as much as we protect us. In Virginia, we must adhere to the Virginia Work Area Protection Manual. I think the Work Area Protection Manual is a great document. I think that it's one of the best in the state or in the country. Work zone risks. You have distracted drivers, impaired drivers, reckless drivers, and confused drivers. We talked about distracted drivers before, cell phones, um, the, the center council in your vehicle, impaired drivers. A lot of the work we do happens at night. You have impaired drivers under the influence of alcohol and drugs that can pose, can pose a very big threat to employees and other drivers. Reckless drivers, people that are late to work, uh, they see us as something inhibiting them. They're used to their commute taking 15 minutes, but when we're out there, it may take a little longer. So they're gonna whip through the work zone, try to get as quickly as they can, ride people's bumpers, not give space for construction vehicles entering and exiting the work zone. And confused drivers. People see cones and drums and they don't know where to go. So you have to ask yourself when you're setting up a work zone, are your work zones confusing? You have to look at it from the view of a 16-year-old kid that just got their license. Are they going to know when this is hanging off here or when you have an upside down dog leg, which way they're supposed to go? I've seen it plenty of times. People are driving fine as soon as they walk into a work zone. They don't know where to go. They go into your lane closure, come out of your lane closure. Before I was in the construction world, I never paid attention to work zones. I just drove right through like it was any normal road that I was driving down. Didn't pay attention to signs. Now, as many of other people that are in this field, you recognize signs and everything that you're supposed to do. <laughs> I've seen this way too many times where there's a flagger sitting off underneath a tree, not directing traffic. And that leaves the public to be confused and not know where to go. Or a flagger right here that's in between signs that you shouldn't be between. You need to give them, because people aren't going to notice that first sign, that second sign. Hopefully they'll notice that third or the fourth. But if you have an employee that's standing there, they might not see him. So you have visu visual distractions, manual distractions, and mental distractions. Your visual uh, work zones, people working around. The biggest one is accidents on the highway. People rubbernecking, looking around, trying to see what's going on instead of paying attention to the 5,000 pound vehicle that they're driving at 40 miles an hour with people right next to them. Manual distractions, reaching for a cell phone, uh, reaching for your sunglasses. Mental distractions, you just got done with work. You're thinking about what you're gonna have for dinner. Um, your drive home your kids yelling in the back seat. Then we have backing hazards. As we talked about before, one of the biggest causes of fatalities and injuries was backing and runover hazards. Um, you have multiple pieces of equipment moving alongside each other, employees on the ground trying to communicate with other employees that are inside equipment. We try to do everything we can, uh, but backing is dangerous. Vosch came out with a standard years ago, the reverse signal operations, which required any vehicle that has a covered view to the rear to have a backup camera, backup alarm, and if one of those is not available, you need to have a spotter. Our company, we put backup alarms, backup cameras on all the equipment. But still, the best thing is to get somebody out there to actually look and spot the area. So here, you have your camera, or you have your mirrors that you see on the outsides of your vehicles. Now, your backup, your mirrors are not going to show you a kid on a tricycle or a kid laying down right behind your vehicle. That's why we came out with backing cameras to try to make that more visible. So at 32 inches, a toddler, a dog, 
pet anything behind you. Your back and camera also diminishes as the distance goes. I had one employee that said, well, I'm just a mirrors kind of guy. We live in an age where we need to use all the technology we have. If you stay with the same process you've done over and over again, you're never going to evolve. Safety hazards, they evolve, and we have to evolve with them. And you can give everybody all the tools in the world, but they need to use them. I used to be a mirrors guy too, and then I got a vehicle that had a backup camera. Now I use a backup camera. Uh, we also put backing alarms on all of our equipment. So you have two types of backing alarms. You have sonar, so as you get closer to something, it starts beeping louder and louder. And you have other backup alarms that, as soon as you go in reverse, it starts beeping. The issue with them, sometimes they get, especially in FDR, they get clogged up with all kinds of dust, so you have to keep them clean. We also added backup cameras. Now, as you can see, these backup cameras are mounted pretty high in the vehicle to give you a large view of what's behind you. A lot of other ones, you, you mount the camera where you have to, which doesn't necessarily provide you with the best view when backing up a piece of equipment. Backup sensors. We started putting these on our construction vehicles. Most newer other vehicles have these sensors on them, but you have changes in ground elevation, dusty environments that can cause those sensors to just go off randomly. They need to be cleaned regularly so that you get a clear reading of what's behind you. Blind spots. Obviously, we deal with large pieces of equipment. The larger your vehicles, the more blind spots you're typically going to have. So right here, you have a picture of a guy. That grader operator isn't necessarily going to see him. And the way that dump truck is backing up, he could be right behind the vehicle. So running over a striking pedestrians, smashing site materials and tools, striking other equipments or vehicles, rollovers or steep slopes. I've seen it plenty of times where guys are looking over one side because there's a ditch line and they're trying to stay straight with the ditch line and they're not paying attention to the person or piece of equipment that's on the other mirror or on the other side. You need to check all your mirrors, backup cameras, everything. We've done the best we can to incorporate more cameras into pieces of equipment to eliminate those blind spots. Um, you have the view from the operator stand right here. And he's got a camera that shows everything that's going on right behind him, right underneath the drum, just in case for some reason somebody needed to grab something underneath there. Because typically that will be the ground man, and the operator's not going to see him. That's why you should always Stay in constant communication with your spotter or ground man, and if you ever lose communication or lose sight of them, stop immediately. This is a blind spot diagram for a motor grader. Um, as you can see, the shaded area is the area where the blind spot is. So you have the blade. Luckily for the grader, they can use GPS, so nobody need, really needs to stand around there. They can kind of do their own thing, but it's still a hazard. You have other buried thing, buried utilities or something that could be around that might not be seen by the greater operator. Cat reclaimer. As you can see, the cab is shifted over to one side. Now, it does shift back and forth, but when your cab is over here, you're not seeing most of your area that's on the right side of the equipment. So an employee standing over here, a vehicle parked over here, is not going to be seen by the operator. When working with uh, cement, lime, you can have a very dusty environment. Um, here the, the cement is loaded into bags, goes into the spreader truck. Those bags sometimes blow off. And uh, there was another pickup in here 
and it's completely covered. The large equipment also doesn't help with visibility, and it makes it difficult for a ground man. There, there's another employee that's about 10 feet from him in there, and you can't see him. One of the biggest hazards, um, a lot of the roads that require FDR are old roads. Before FDR, all they did was overlay, overlay, overlay. So nobody really knows how deep certain utilities are or what could be underneath there. It's important to call um, Miss Utility before um, disturbing any of, the, any of the ground beneath where you're working. Um, also, good to look for above ground indicators and proper potholing techniques. So this is a piece of equipment we use. Where instead of using a shovel to pothole that could damage any kind of line that's underneath, this uses air to break up and suck out the dirt and debris that is in the subgrade. And they can complete one of these potholes in about five minutes. We just introduced this last year and we haven't had any utility strikes or anything. And then the material you can dump right back onto the road. No need to haul it off anymore. So very often, it's an underground uh, cable line, or in that case, you have a gas line or an electrical line, which can be hazardous. You clip one of those, and you have gas spilling out. You could blow up your machine injure your employees that are around. So it's very important to look for these underground lines. Communication lines are just as expensive when you hit them too. Um, above ground indicators. So we reclaimed this area. Uh, they came and marked it. And they thought they were good. They knew the line was there. But these markings were added afterwards. They thought they were OK, didn't notice a cable box that was sitting right there that ran all the way along to one of those green boxes that sits out of the ground. They came through there, cut the line, because there were no markings. So one of the issues with FDR is sometimes when you need to take that asphalt off, they come in, they mark the asphalt, asphalt is disturbed, and nobody ever comes in there again to mark it again before the FDR process begins. So it's important to look for above ground indicators to figure out where those lines are. That way you know where to pothole to try to figure out how deep those lines are before going in there and reclaiming the area. Sometimes we work on tall pieces of equipment. You have fall hazards. Um, this is another one of those bag loaded cement spreader trucks. Um, we've tried our best to engineer those out and get these cyclone trucks so there's no need for somebody to go up on top of the equipment. As you can see here, they don't have any kind of fall protection and they are well above the six foot limit. Even if you do have fall protection, now here's a great example of the fall protection being up. They have the, the cross beams, but Equipment gets used, doesn't necessarily get maintained out there, and it ends up looking like this, where 
raggedy bent rails, cross beams don't fit in anymore. So those cyclone machines are the best for avoiding that hazard. Anytime you're introducing other chemicals into the ground, uh, there's always going to be an environmental hazard. So many of the times you'll need to store lime, cement, calcimite, emulsion on site in a large tank like this. Now what happened here is a seal broke. Underneath here caused material to leak out and then got down into this water supply. Luckily, it was all contained. That was just kind of a runoff area. Um, it didn't go into any kind of water or anything like that. But there's always those environmental hazards that you have to look out for. So it's important to create berms around um, tanked material and make sure proper maintenance to make sure seals are maintained. Uh, the last hazard is changing teeth underneath the drum. Anytime you're messing with hydraulics, there is the possibility that the hydraulics can fail. It's important to put your lock, lock out your legs and always be wearing PPE, safety glasses, hard hats, anytime you're working underneath equipment. Keys to safety. This is a dangerous job. Um, it's large equipment that is very unforgiving. Uh, if you mess up a little bit, it could cost you an arm, leg, or even your life. Uh, don't get complacent. A lot of injuries happen. It's the brand new employees that haven't been properly trained. Or it's the guys that have been doing, doing the job for 30 years that I've always done it this way. And I haven't gotten hurt yet. Nobody else has gotten hurt yet, so why don't I keep it doing it that way? Like I said before, we need to evolve. Safety needs to evolve as hazards evolve. Uh, don't cut corners. For the most part, people get paid hourly. Take a little bit more time. That five minutes that you saved is going to cost a whole lot longer if somebody gets hurt or equipment is down because you need to fix the piece of equipment so your crew is down for four days. Teach safety as a value. Um, safety is always seen as some kind of enforcement, the, the police of the construction world. Um, it's a value. Everybody wants to go home safe at the end of the day. So it's an accident. They don't just happen at work. They happen at home too. So if you use this value, try to always think safely, you're going to extend your quality of life a whole lot more. Proper training is essential. Uh, I hear from people all the time, oh, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do that. Train your employees the best you can to, to recognize hazards, to understand what the dangers are and how to operate equipment safely. And look out for the people around you. Like I said, your crews, the people you're working with, you work with them for a long time. They become your family. And you don't want to see them get hurt. You don't want to, before I leave a job site, if I see something's wrong, I feel the need to say something. Because if I leave and something happens, all I can think about is, well, I, could, I saw that and I just let it go. I didn't say anything that could have stopped that from happening. Is the risk worth the reward? Will my actions harm anyone else around me? Will my actions cause harm to myself? Will my actions cause me not to come home to my family in the same way I left them in the morning? 